Thank you for joining us. My name is Tori Holthouse, and I'm a registered dietitian with Functional Formularies, the makers of Liquid Hope and Nourish, the world's first and only organic, whole food, and plant-based feeding tube formulas and oral meal replacements. Today's webinar, Just Food, Traditional and Revolutionary Principles of Health and Healing, will provide an overview of the most frequently asked questions and controversial topics in the field of nutrition, including Ayurveda, pH balanced diets, ketogenic diets, intermittent fasting, and paleo diets. Functional formularies chooses not to endorse any one type of food pattern for an entire population and recommends that individuals check with their medical team before beginning the use of any of these diets. The information presented in this webinar should not be considered medical advice and is not intended to prevent, treat, or cure disease. At the end of today's webinar, we will have time for questions. So as you think of questions during this webinar, please type them in the chat box and we will get to them at the end of today's session, just as long as we have time and we'll get to all of them that we can. This webinar has been given prior, prior approval for one continuing education credit for registered dietitians and dietetic technicians with the Commission on Dietetic Registration. After today's webinar, I'll be sending you a certificate of completion so that you can claim those credits with CDR. Speaking on today's webinar is Dr. John Bagnulo, the Director of Nutrition here at Functional Formularies. Here with the team, John leads nutrition research and development initiatives to make whole foods nutrition accessible for all people, including those people who require the use of a feeding tube. John is a core faculty member with the Center for Mind-Body Medicine in Washington, D.C. He has taught a variety of nutrition and exercise physiology courses at numerous universities and frequently leads talks and programs on topics such as inflammation, heart health, and metabolic syndrome. John holds a doctorate in human nutrition and food science from the University of Maine and a master's of public health from the University of North Carolina. Thanks for being with us today, John, and I'll turn the presentation over to you. All right. Well, thank you, Tori, and welcome, everyone. It's great to be with you this afternoon. I only wish I were with you in person. Um, this looks like from just looking at who's with us today, everybody comes from such different backgrounds. We have people that are you know, working with various populations in, in real desperate need of, of, of care. And we have people who are on the research and development side of things. So it's great. It's great to have that diversity. And hopefully we can together dive into this uh, topic, which is, I, I think, an important one because so many of us work uh, in various settings where, as you, as you know, there's so much confusion and controversy around ways of eating. And, you know, I thought when we just when we decided to offer a series of webinars, this would be the, the best one to offer as an initial one, because, you know, there's some really important questions that need to be asked. And, and, and there's some you know paradigms that I think a lot of us have operated under, certainly myself included, over the years that need to be questioned. So as you know, again, as Tori, as Tori mentioned, this is not intended to provide any medical advice or any one way of eating. Really, what I want people to get out of this, out of this discussion, is I, I want people to ask questions. You know, how does diet influence health? And you know, are there patterns within ways of eating, within you know particular foods or macronutrients that have a more profound influence on health than others? So, if we were to just consider a handful of early human cultures, societies that use nutrition as an integral or significant component of how they helped members within their community or in their culture survive or overcome illness, you know, we, we've got some, you know, some very, although very different, we've got some very old um, applications that have been, you know, around for thousands of years in some cases. You know, Ayurveda, which we'll spend a short amount of time on this afternoon, is several thousand years old. Um, it is a way of eating that is still alive and well in India. Um, I've had a chance to travel all through India and meet people uh, who use Ayurveda on a daily basis to have a very high quality of health. And I've started to meet more and more people here in the United States and in Canada that also follow an Ayurvedic way of life, not just with respect to food, that they feel has really allowed them to thrive. So, you know, that would be an excellent example of a 
have a very strong cultural application with respect to food and again other lifestyle characteristics that you know make a difference for some people when you talk with them Chinese medicine uh, of course has an enormous food component and that food is also matched to individuals based on their constitution or their particular needs um, this is one as well as the next two with respect to Greek medicine and um, the oldest Central African nutrition and herbal medicine that I actually have the least amount of uh, research to share with you this afternoon. But I, I think it's important to at least bring these up and discuss these because they do illustrate how pivotal food has been with respect to the recommendations made in earlier human cultures. Uh, whether that would be a day-to-day -day menu or particular herbs that would be added to a population's diet. There's, this is, there's a really a, an extensive history here, human history, with using plants, herbs, and ways of eating to help people uh, achieve a higher quality of health. So if we were to take a look now uh, with that as a backdrop, if we were to take a, a look at some common ancestral dietary patterns versus the more recent widely accepted consensus if you were to you know poll a thousand physicians or a thousand people on the streets of North America as to you know what is you know generally a healthy diet you'd see that there's a very very uh, stark contrast between the ways that early human populations and some still today eat you know whether that's looking at a traditional Sri Lankan diet or some of the Pacific Islanders who get considerable portions of their calories from fat. In some cases, it's 75% of their calories from fat for big parts of the year. Or looking at other populations, for instance, off you know some of the islands off the coast of Greece, where people eat a very, very traditional and very accurate Mediterranean diet, if we were to look at what that actually entails. These are, these are again, stark contrast to what most people have accepted as a normal way of eating. In some cases, uh, they consider it to be a very natural way for humans to eat. Uh, and, and we could even go further. Some some populations, you know, would look at an organic uh, grain-based low-fat diet as being, you know, the gold standard for how we were or are intended to eat. But again, you know, that's a much more contemporary uh, perspective than would be those populations, whether we're talking about Native Americans or, or indigenous populations in other areas of the world who had much more traditional ancestral diets. I, again, I, I think this is an important backdrop to today's conversation because we're, we're going to now embark on a conversation looking at some very popular dietary recommendations that have enormous followings. You've, I'm sure you're going to be familiar with several of these. And there's a lot of confusion around those. There's some fear around those that they are either not healthy, that they put a person or a population at greater risk for either deficiencies or some type of toxicity or something like hyperlipidemia. And, you know, if we take a look at these, which we will in as great a detail as the clinical research and the studies provide, that, that's really what I want to maintain is always that evidence-based perspective. I think that's important for all of us in our careers, our day-to-day -day life, the work that we do, we, we have to have something as an anchor or as a rudder, so to speak, to keep us on track so that we don't um, start to go down too many rabbit holes, so to speak, with all of these, you know, really this infinite number of different approaches that are out there. All right. So that being said, again, in 1980, we established our first dietary guidelines for Americans. And I'm, I only chuckle because it's at that point in time and it, it could be a coincidence. It's, it's hard to say. My grandmother always said that there was no such thing as coincidences. But in 1980, when we adopted the first dietary guidelines for Americans, we saw a sharp increase in obesity as well as just a, a BMI greater than 25, which, you know, of course, by definition is, is overweight status for Americans. And it's certainly gotten, um, you know, it's gotten much worse um, in, in the the last two decades that it did in that first decade of these last 30 years. But again, if we go on this CDC data, you know, it's it's real interesting to, to note that those dietary guidelines, which again, tended to promote that, that consensus that I talked about early, which was lower fat, higher carbohydrate, um, you know, really staying away from things like dietary cholesterol and saturated fat in particular, uh, as well as maybe a restriction on sodium intake without, without really making qualitative differences with respect to the types of fats that may be in a population's diet, 
um, and also without enough attention to looking at the quality of carbohydrates and the importance of micronutrients such as potassium and magnesium, which we know now make an enormous difference overall in a in a any population's overall health outcomes at any given point. So then the next question we have to ask ourselves is how is it we've been measuring the efficacy or the effectiveness of any dietary intervention that may have been recommended for either general health or a particular condition? And I think most of us, uh, I, I certainly am old enough now to, to have this experience and I'm not sure about others of you, but cholesterol has, in my opinion, been one of the most important or premier outcomes, measurements, biomarkers, or targets of any dietary intervention. And we really haven't seen, up until recently, efforts to gain great, greater glycemic control. Um, all along the way, there have been various uh, investigations as to what's important for weight control or weight loss. And then the one at the bottom I find most intriguing, which is longevity. And other than, you know, the, the type of work put forth by Dan Wetner, a former writer for National Geographic, who has written Blue Zones, there really hasn't been, you know, that much in the way of epidemiological investigation into how dietary patterns match uh, longevity patterns. So, you know, with that being said, I would, I would like to take a look, if we could, at, again, at that initial paradigm around around cholesterol um, with a few slides I have for you. But before we get there, these are what I would consider to be those biomarkers and or outcomes that warrant much greater inclusion going forward as nutritionists, as registered dietitians, as researchers. From whatever area of nutrition uh, you may be involved, I would highly encourage you to look at the research surrounding fasting insulin and its use in, in developing a HOMA 1R score. And if you're not familiar with the HOMA 1R score, it is widely agreed upon by endocrinologists, primarily in the field of diabetes and insulin resistance work, to be the most effective way that we can, uh, in, in essence, capture what's going on in an individual with respect to insulin resistance and how well their insulin is working for them or against them. And to calculate a HOMA 1R score, you have to know the fasting insulin level of an individual. It was it then is simply multiplied times their fasting glucose and divided by um, one of two different denominators, either 22.5 or 405, depending upon which type of units you're converting this uh, into, whether you're going to be using milligrams per deciliter or micromoles. So this is a really important, uh, really important formula for us to understand better and how it relates to dietary patterns. And there's some really fascinating work uh, which has already been done on this, especially around a couple of these different dietary interventions we're going to bring up here in a moment. But I would consider fasting insulin to be overall a more accurate representation of what is going on within an individual's health than total cholesterol. But again, by and large, it's, it's not been used in any of the more general health population studies comparatively. It has really been held uh, as has the next one, hemoglobin A1C, in reserve for people who already have diabetes. And there's a, you know, there are a good number of studies of looking at HbA1c uh, in terms of measuring outcomes for di diabetic patients, but fasting insulin would be at the top of this list. When it comes to lipids, you know, under the umbrella of, of various fats and cholesterol uh, carriers, I would consider the high-density lipoprotein to triglyceride ratio to be far more uh, important than a total cholesterol value. You really want to try to have your HDLs higher than your triglycerides, which means you'd want to have a ratio that is better than 1.0. And you'd want to keep triglycerides, if you could, to under 100 and optimally under 80 when we really start to look at uh, some of the details in the, in the data surrounding that. So those would be really good biomarkers to for us going forward as a research-based community to ask for, and if we're involved in research, to try to incorporate that into the studies that we're involved with. But I, again, I, I wouldn't um, I wouldn't in any way neglect anthropometric measurements such as waist-to-hip ratios or BMIs, which have been used now for decades, and actually. I feel have have their place in this, as well as some newer ones such as C-reactive proteins, 
um, whether you were talking about highly sensitive CRP or otherwise that can detect inflammation that, as we're going to look at here in a few minutes, can certainly be generated from dietary imbalance. So taking a look at, you know, this is a, one of my favorite slides, and I, I, I've used this over the you know, last several years to really make people think more closely about total cholesterol and how it relates to health. If you take a look at this BHF heart stats data, um, which goes back now to 2005, so, you know, more than a decade old, you'll see that if you look at these, you know, again, a large number of studies, many of which are meta-analysis within themselves, you see that there's a, a sweet spot for total cholesterol between 200 and 250. That's this, in the bottom of this U-shaped curve where you get the lowest all-cause mortality. And this is, you know, again, this is not new. If you take a look at uh, World Health Organization data, for death and serum cholesterol levels. And again, this is measured in millimoles, which is easy to convert. You just multiply um, times 38.7. So for instance, a millimole value of 5.0 would be about 198 or so for a serum cholesterol in milligrams per deciliter. You see that when you get over that 5.00 millimole mark, uh, which is about 200 or so milligrams per deciliter, you start to have lower risk, all cause death rates. So both for heart disease as well as, again, for all-cause mortality. And this has been shown, just so you're aware of that, it's been shown for, again, cardiovascular death rates as well as all-cause mortality for both women as well as for men. And the Pearson's correlation coefficients or the R values are very low for some of these, which would suggest no relationship um, at at best and maybe a actual inverse relationship, which is very surprising when people consider this. So again, we don't really um, have the data to support the cholesterol lowering goal uh, for better overall health that unfortunately most of the dietary recommendations, advice, and plans are disseminated for. So I think that's a really important paradigm to question as I mentioned earlier this afternoon. Now in the in the area of glycemic control, we do know that if we were to take a look at those macronutrients that have the greatest influence over glycemic control, it is obviously sugar, restrict, restricting sugar in simple carbohydrates first and foremost. And, you know, you can see that whether, whether you're looking at, you know, research around people who have diabetes and already have a certain level of dysglycemia or loss of glycemic control, or you're looking at populations with no predetermined risk factors. In either case, whether you're following this population that is not at risk yet, or you're working with a population who already is at risk, restricting sugar and refined carbohydrate intake is first and foremost, it's imperative. And with that, it's important to note, especially if you're familiar with the work of David Ludwig um, at the Harvard School of Public Health and also, you know, certainly the primary investigator uh, and the head of the New Balance Obesity Prevention Center at Boston Children's Hospital. You know, his work has really shed incredible volumes of light on this topic and how many sources of carbohydrates are no different than simple sugars upon very simple early digestion within the stomach or the more proximal uh, small intestine. So whether we're talking about a highly refined uh, grain product, which requires very little salivary amylase to take that to the monosaccharide or the sugar unit, or we're talking about things such as, you know, refined sugar, corn syrup, and those types of simple sugars. In, in many ways, these are um, synonymous with the effects that they produce on insulin and leading to various levels of insulin resistance. So Carbohydrates are important in a variety of different forms to restrict and to keep, uh, you know, a certain ceiling on. And again, when we take a look at those macronutrients that tend to produce with their restriction the greatest amount of weight loss or the best overall weight control for populations, time and time again, lower carbohydrate. I'm not going to say low carbohydrate diets, and you'll see why in a moment, but lower carbohydrate densities is probably the most accurate way that we could portray those interventions which produce the most favorable effects with respect to not only, again, glycemic control, but also weight loss or more effective waste, weight management. And glycemic, glycemic indexes and glycemic loads um, can be very useful tools. Again, the work that Dr. Ludwig has done is, has been very eye-opening for many people. Um, but with that being said, 
the carbohydrate density is also a very important parameter with which carbohydrate quality can be measured. And it's very simple. It's just how many grams of carbohydrate we get per 100 grams of any given food. And when we start to take a look at all these various methods for assessing the quality of the carbohydrates in a population's diet, it seems to be where it's at with respect to the highest level of efficacy in helping people gain glycemic control and to achieve significant weight loss or better weight control. So what are people recommending today from a variety of different um, areas of nutrition advice, whether that's coming from RDs or that's coming from uh, you know, physicians, various, you know, various types of physicians, whether they be you know, more in the area of endocrinology or, or specialize in diabetes, um, or the, whether that be within the area of functional medicine, which is certainly a growing, uh, growing number of physicians countrywide or you know, North America wide, what we see is that the four newest ones are that if you were to take a poll from people who had been offered something that was new and had not been offered prior, it would be the paleo diet, the ketogenic diet, intermittent fasting, or Ayurveda. If we were to look at those diets which have been around for you know, in terms of being recommended for a much longer period of time um, and or are based on the results from research that have been tried, you know, have really where they've it's attempted to be extrapolated to a, a general general population. We, you know, we would range from the low fat Ornish type diet to the exact polar opposite, which would be the very high protein Atkins diet to some of those which have been specifically designed um, for people of uh, particular conditions or diseases such as the American Heart Association um, intervention or diet. Then you've got the general recommendations such as the, the more recent MyPlate or the previous USDA Food Guide Pyramid, the Mediterranean Food Guide Pyramid that was put forth by Walter Willett. And of course you have, you know, uh, and we're going to get into these in, in various ways, you have, again, you have many individuals who are you know, big, big advocates are plant-based, vegetarian, and vegan diets for good reason. We'll, we'll take a look at those in a moment. And this is the newest one, which I find most intriguing because I think it ties a lot of the common denominators together within this slide. And that's the pH balanced diet. Uh, if you would ask me what pH balanced meant when I was a graduate student at the University of North Carolina 20 years ago, I would have thought you were talking about some type of shampoo. Um, but now we, we certainly understand much more about a pH balanced diet, what it entails, what its goals are, and again, a growing body of evidence to suggest that that may be uh, a good place for many of us to start from, depending on who we're working with. So for those of you who aren't familiar with David Katz's work um, in the area of public health, he's, he's done a you know really an amazing job. And he put together this paper along with Meller um, back in 2014, so it's, it's about two years old now, which looked at some of the more commonly recommended diets, a lot like what we're talking about today. It wasn't uh, taking a look at things like intermittent fasting or ketogenic because at that time, those diets were certainly not as popular as they are now, just two years later. But it did look at many of these other diets we've talked about as well as the Mediterranean diet. And you know what? What David came up with, and for those of you who know David, um, I, I've, I've known David for a few years working together for the Center for Mind-Body Medicine. He's, he's really taken this on. He's, he's really a pioneer in trying to address the commonalities between, you know, for lack of a better word, effective diets, good diets, healthy diets. And he's really trying to show us over the years the common threads. And you know what he has consistently come up with, and certainly this uh, review of all of them indicated the same is that those diets which contain the largest amount of minimally processed plant food, uh, which have not inadvertently been converted into sugars, which have not had, you know, the processed meats, which we know contain a certain amount of risk associated with them because of that processing. Time and time again, that is the common thread that can make any of these, as well as some of the ones we're talking about today, you know, real viable options for populations that have specific needs or want to eat a certain way. So it's a great paper. Uh, I've included that here. I'd love for you to, you know, dive into this when you get a chance and you can look at this in clo closer detail. But again, it really comes down to the amount of whole, minimally processed plant foods, regardless of their fat content, regardless of, you know, whether they may be, uh, you know, found in legumes or found in vegetables or found with the sugars that accompany fruits, for instance, that regardless of that, 
the, the amount of minimally processed plant material in the diet is the one thing we can say is shared upon by those diets which you tend to see the best overall measurable outcomes, whether you're looking at a particular biomarker or di disease risk reduction. Now, the reason that I, you know, I, <laughs> I'd like to show that slide by, by Dr. Katz, but I also want people to understand there's a lot of confusion around what an actual low fat diet is or a low carb diet. And that's what makes it very difficult for many of us in our day-to-day -day practice to kind of, you know, read through this literature and, and understand that there are many limitations with respect to the investigations that have been made in these two areas. Because in many cases, a low fat diet is one depicted at as anywhere from 10 upwards to 30% of calories coming from fat. And that certainly wouldn't be low fat. And again, depending on where that fat is coming from, that could be, um, you know, there could be certain risks or there could be certain levels of protection that could also be afforded in that mislabeled low fat diet. In, in, in essence, I'm saying if that 30% of calories in what is being labeled as a low fat diet were coming from um, some highly refined vegetable oil, which has a very high omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, that's going to carry an inherent set of risk factors that would not be found in a similar amount of fat that would be coming from something like coconut oil or olive oil, things that we know by looking at re the research now um, have much more favorable uh, impacts on a population's or on an individual's health. So, and then on the same thing with a low carb diet, you know, you can see that many low, low carb diets are, you know, somewhere between 30 and 37% um, of the calories coming from carbohydrates. And by definition, that's not a low carb diet. A low carb diet would contain less than 130 grams of carbohydrates per day. And if we calculate that to calories, you're talking about 520 calories or less coming from uh, you know, coming from carbohydrates. So for many people, that's considerably less than 30%. That's going to be 20 to 25% of calories coming from carbohydrates. And again, depending on the qualities of those carbohydrates, it could be a very different outcome with respect to an investigation that would compare a low carb to a standard American diet. And again, this is important stuff for us to consider because Time and time again, we read these reviews put forth by advocates for one way of eating, whether it's high fat Atkins or an Ornish type diet, and they're very critical of the other diets. And they tend to pick and choose those studies, which they have the easiest time identifying pitfalls within. And if you're, um, you're going to compare a low carb diet to a low fat diet and the quality of the fat in your low fat diet is good, but the quality of carbs in your low carb diet at 34% of calories are predominantly made up of sugars and simple starches, you're going to get a, a skewed comparison. And I, I just want everyone to understand that because we're at a point now when it comes to looking at research uh, where quite often the definitions of the, of the overall dietary intervention do not fit the criteria that we would expect. So here are some, you know, more accurate representations of, and this is how they, you know, typically are represented when they're recommended by the advocates for those. So for instance, like a Walter Willett at the Harvard School of Public Health, who's a big advocate for the Mediterranean diet. If we were to look at, you know, his typical definition, you're getting about 40 to 45% of calories um, from carbohydrates, a variety of sources. Uh, the, the fat would predominantly be from things like olive oil and nuts and seeds. Uh, and the protein would be somewhere between 10 and 20% of calories, but it'd usually be about 15% on average. Um, you know, that is significantly lower in terms of the carbohydrate content than the standard American diet, which is going to be giving, you know, people typically 50 to 55% of calories from carbohydrate. Not a lot of details there. Some of that carbohydrate intake can be, uh, for many Americans, predominantly refined or high glycemic. The Ornish diet is at the top of the list here in terms of the carbohydrate content being 60% or more of the percent of calories for an individual or for those people that he's looked at, uh, Dean Ornish has looked at there in his uh, his research center in Sausalito, California. And again, I, you're going to find good results with many of these different interventions, whether it's the Mediterranean intervention, the Ornish type intervention. But typically, uh, you know, this is really important for us to know is that in, in these instances, we are comparing those typically to the standard American diet, which doesn't have the quality, um, the details around the qualities of carbohydrates or the qualities of the fats. And, and that may be, you know, why we see with a lot of these different interventions such, you know, appealing results.
Now, at the below that dotted line, you'll see you have the paleo diet, and this is highly variable. I wouldn't want anyone to think that a paleo diet was always 30% of calories coming from protein or that it was always less than 30% of calories coming from carbohydrates because really paleo only means a few things, which is that it's absent of grain, um, that it's also absent of legumes, and that it's absent of dairy products as well as refined oils. So it's easy to see that a paleo diet could be very high fat or it could be very low fat depending upon the foods that were chosen by uh, you know, either the investigator or the individual in the case of an N equals one type of uh, case study. Then at the bottom, we have the ketogenic diet, which is very restricted in carbohydrate intake. Um, again, less than a true definition of a ketogenic diet is that it should be less than 20% of calories coming from protein. And I'd say that a more accurate representation would be restricted to 10% of calories coming from protein, less than 10% of calories coming from carbohydrates. Again, you can see there's an enormous range depicted here, but if you look at well-conducted research in the area of ketosis and the benefits of the ketogenic diet, carbohydrates have to be under 10% of total calories. That would be net carbs, so fiber wouldn't count. Protein has to be at 10% or so or less. Uh, and fat makes up the difference, which is typically going to be 80 to 85% of calories. So this kind of gives you an idea of where this stands. Now, I have not included the Ayurvedic diet on this because that is highly dependent on the individual as well as the practitioner who sees a particular fit um, for an individual. And in the Ayurvedic diet, again, can have high diversity with respect to the fat, the carbohydrate, and the protein content of an individual's recommendations. Uh, and I also don't have it, intermittent fasting on here, which we're going to cover in a few moments, because intermittent fasting, again, could be made up of a wide variety of macronutrients, and it doesn't have to necessarily fit any of these other criteria. So I would like to first discuss the uh, paleo diet, which is sometimes often referred to as a hunter-gatherer diet. I I have problems with a hunter-gatherer diet because it's you could easily be gatherer-hunter, and that as soon as you put hunter on there, people tend to make associations between paleo and a diet high in meat, which certainly shouldn't be the case. The paleo diet, again, as I just mentioned, is free of legumes, it's free of grains, it's free of dairy products. It should be, anyways, by definition of what paleo is. This was first first put forth, excuse me, by Lauren Cordain, who's considered to be here in North America, the really the pioneer in this area in terms of showing what metabolic benefits can be gained by following a paleo diet, paleolithic type diet. This is what our ancestors would have consumed more than 15,000 years ago before the advent of agriculture. And with this diet, you tend to produce uh, in, in relatively short periods of time, in some cases, as little as 10, 10 days. If you look at, for instance, some of those pilot studies that have been conducted by Frasetto, you see remarkable results in short periods of time. And again, it's, it, it's for a variety of reasons, but one of the foremost uh, reasons is that you have a marked reduction in the carbohydrate density of the diet. As soon as you start to remove bread products and cereal products and foods that are made with flour, you tend to have a marked drop off in the glycemic index, the glycemic load. But again, as I'll say again, more, most importantly, in my opinion, the carbohydrate density of the diet. And so people tend to get market improvements in their fasting insulin levels, in that glycemic control, which we know is important. And they tend to see very favorable results with respect to the triglyceride um, to HDL ratio or the inverse of that ratio, HDL to triglyceride ratio. So again, it, I think that whether you're looking at this for you know, cardiovascular risk reduction, uh, i.e. metabolic syndrome patterns, or you're looking at that uh, for something like weight control or weight loss. There's, there's a reason why this um, has so much critical mass behind it as a way of eating. I mean, there are now magazines devoted entirely to a paleolithic way of eating or way of lifestyle. Uh, and there's a considerable amount of research. I, I just picked a few here in the last few years to share with you in today's webinar, some of the more recent um, papers, research papers that have investigated this. But there's a growing body of evidence that while it doesn't have to be paleo, um, some of these paleo principles really do seem to work out in human trials in short periods of time. So again, it's, it's worth looking at as something that can maybe be combined if someone is interested with some of the other interventions or approaches we're going to talk about. It doesn't have to, as, as both Tori and I have mentioned, this is not intended to be a one-size-fits-all talk. It's just really trying to get us to, as practitioners, as investigators, for those of us who are interested, to ask, more importantly, 
you know, quite, m most importantly, I would say questions that surround the, the relationship between ways of eating, dietary patterns and influences that that has on human health. Because I, I just don't feel that these questions are being asked enough. Are there populations that eat a paleo type diet? There, there certainly are. They're being looked at by a variety of different researchers from those in the area of diabetes, insulin resistance work to those who are focused primarily on the microbiome and maybe the, the roles that the microbiome plays in, in the etiology of various diseases. But, you know, if we look at those areas of, of Central to South Africa, where populations still follow a very traditional gatherer hunter diet, there's populations in South America that also, you know, again, have that very ancestral way of eating. And, and some of these populations will have modest to small amounts of dairy products and, uh, and grains in their diet and do remarkably well, um, even with that included. So again, it, it, it's, it is, I think, both very uh, fascinating for us to take a look at these populations and at the same time, I think it is also interesting to, to see that there may be room for hybrids here within the, you know, under the umbrella of whether it's paleo or intermittent fasting, we're going to take a look at in a moment, that it may not have to be um, all in with respect to these, that there could be room for various combinations. The paper that has really provided the greatest physiological explanation for why people tend to see great results with a paleo type diet would be the work of someone such as Ian Spreadbury, his paper, um, which looked at ancestral diets, their acellular carbohydrate content, which is i.e. grains and grain products and how that really drives um, a variety of inflammatory conditions that may ultimately um, arise from aberrations within the microbiome, especially in the distal small intestine where you get bacterial overgrowth in response to some of these very high carbohydrate dense diets. This paper is free to any of you who would like to look at it in, uh, in entirety and in great detail through Dovetail Press Online. It's a wonderful paper that was uh, really focused towards diabetes and diabetes control. And it's now really become a landmark paper when we start to look at what it takes to not only reverse diabetes and insulin resistance, but where we can really produce favorable changes in other areas of health as well. And if we take a look at the relationship here between carbohydrate dense foods um, and particular effects, again, this all is going to be downstream from what happens when bacterial pop populations in the distal small intestines, uh, you know, tend to reach you know, tend to reach that overgrowth level when they're fed a high carbohydrate dense meal day after day. And if you take a look at those foods, many of our um, ancestral foods have very, very low carbohydrate densities. And it's only when you start to look at those things at the top of this uh, horizontal bar graph that you get carbohydrate densities, which unfortunately make up the foundation of carbohydrates in many Americans' diets. Here are the most common misconceptions around ancestral um, or hunter-gatherer type diets, paleo diets, i.e. One of the most common misconceptions, as I mentioned earlier, is that they have to be high protein, that they have to be low carbohydrate, um, that they are going to inherently carry a high metabolic acid load or a high potential renal acid load, PRAL equation, um, that they have to be very high in saturated fat, that they're going to produce very unfavorable changes with respect to serum cholesterol or any other lipid biomarker. Many um, MDs and RDs have concerns that they're going to be too low in fiber, that they're not going to be nutritionally complete, or that they're going to, again, carry some type of inherent risk factor associated with them, either that they're not providing nutrients or that they're going to put someone at greater risk for cardiovascular disease and or diabetes. And I want to say that with all of these, um, none, of, none of these are true. All of these are in some way, shape, or form, they are going to be preconceived notions that a lot of people carry forward around this type of dietary recommendation. Someone could follow a paleolithic diet and eat sweet potatoes at most of their meals. Um, they could eat fruit at every meal. They could uh, get the majority of their fat from things like avocados uh, and other, you know, nuts and seeds. You know, it, it's time and time again, um, when I work or talk with individuals who have concerns around this type of dietary intervention. This is what I hear. And, 
I just want to say that there's no evidence whatsoever to suggest that the this type of diet puts people at greater risk. And again, as I shared with you, there are you know a significant number of papers now to show that it can produce favorable outcomes, but you know it may not have to be all or nothing. There may be important principles from a paleo type diet that could be applied without having to forego you know one of the food groups such as whether it be dairy products or legumes or something like that. So. Again, just things to think about as we go forward. And, and now we're going to look at intermittent fasting um, because intermittent fasting is, has become very, very popular for many individuals who have struggled with either their weight, um, with their energy levels. They are looking for you know an, another option as opposed to calorie restriction or low carb where they feel like they're hungry all the time. And intermittent fasting is... Again, it's, there's a growing body of evidence suggesting that it is extremely therapeutic, especially for particular neurological conditions or neurodegenerative diseases, um, as well as for you know, individuals who are looking to gain control over gly their you know, glycemic control or their weight. So there's a couple different uh, ways that someone could come upon the recommendation to go forward with intermittent fasting. And just really what it looks like is you want to restrict eating to a, anywhere between eight and six hours a day. So you have 16 hours a day when uh, an individual is not eating. Um, the reason that's important is that, you know, the postprandial state or fed state can last for, you know, anywhere from four to five hours, depending on what the composition of the last meal was. Then the post-absorptive state can last for up to 12 hours, even longer, again, depending upon that last meal and the individual who consumed it. But that fasted state typically doesn't start for much, you know, it doesn't start much sooner than 12 hours. In some cases, maybe a little bit one way or the other. And it, that's going to be a function typically of the meal that was last had and the individual. But these are the general recommendations for intermittent fasting is, you know, people do not eat after a certain time in the evening or late in the day. And then they don't eat until sometime around noon or so the next day. And the reason this is more beneficial for some individuals is that there are really important physiological processes within the human cell that start to become upregulated with a more prolonged abstinence from food, avoiding that postprandial or fed or absorptive state. When you get out of those windows of time, you start to have higher levels of autophagy, which is a really important process for a cell's ability to recycle damaged uh, cellular hardware, whether that be the protein manufacturing uh, factories, such as the rough endoplasmic reticulum or the mitochondria, which can become damaged, especially as we get older. Um, it's also autophagy is a very important way for cells to kick viruses out of the cell. In some cases, as in the case with the herpes virus, it's really the only way that the human body can, in a natural physiological way, defend itself against particular viruses which become embedded into cells and can evade normal autophagy, um, you know, at low levels, which would only occur after around 12 hours or so of not eating. It need, takes a little bit of a longer window of time to get some of those viruses um, completely out of a cell. Apoptosis or cell programmed death, again, important for uh, those cells which have damaged genetic material to basically self-destruct and, and to be eliminated from our cellular pool. And ketones really start to climb after around 15 to 16 hours. Some important details are that the fats and oils uh, do not interfere with intermittent fasting. So having a significant quantity of fat um, in the early morning can still allow this intermittent fat fasting process to roll on. But protein and carbohydrate sources do have to be restricted to very modest or small amounts in that fasting state. So, you know, using something like coconut flakes, for instance, can work as long as someone isn't eating so many coconut flakes that the carbohydrates and the protein levels uh, creep up to a level that will interfere with this uh, intermittent fasting. Ketogenic diets, which, you know, have some overlap with intermittent fasting are those which are very restricted in both carbohydrate and protein content. Again, I've mentioned that there are varying uh, you know, recommendations made in both clinical as well as in you know, outpatient uh, type settings where people are given much, much wider ranges of carbohydrate and proteins to choose from than the research would actually support. What I mean by this is that if we take a look at um, some of you, and I'll come back to those slides, but if you take a look at some of the recommendations that have been put forth over the last several decades, 
with respect to a ketogenic diet, quite often we hear four to one ratios of fat to carbs and protein combined, or in some cases even three to one. Those are not nearly as effective as more detailed recommendations around the fat, the protein, the carbohydrates. And this is important because someone could get, you know, more protein at, let's say if their protein was, you know, something like 20% protein, no carb, but their fat was 80, you got a four to one ratio. But at 20% protein, there's a good chance someone is not going to be in ketosis because that level of protein is very e it's very easy for the body to come out of ketosis with that and start to manufacture higher levels of, of glucose from that. So, you know, it's really important to have the details in place when you are considering um, either recommending a ketogenic diet for an individual or developing a type of protocol for your institution. It's also important to understand that saturated fat and monounsaturated fats would be the best most beneficial fats to have as the foundation for that large amount of fat in the diet um, and that fiber be present at almost every meal if possible because and again this is from non-starchy vegetables um, there's a way to use things like potato starch and other sources of resistant starch that would not contribute any net carbs to an individual's um, metabolism but it's really important that this not simply become a highly refined diet made up of no fiber or low fiber and be made up of highly refined vegetable oils because that will not really offer a patient or a population the benefits that a well-formulated, more specifically detailed ketogenic diet will. Um, other things that people should really understand is that it's, got, it's received a bad rap from its early days when it was used primarily in the 1950s. And again, it should be noted that the American Medical Association recommended a ketogenic diet um, as the primary, you know, primary recommendation for children with epilepsy in the 1950s. And it had, you know, significant amount of effectiveness for that, but that it, it's became looked at as too cumbersome, too difficult to follow. And a lot of that is the fact that it was based on, you know, like this, what we call the mayonnaise, mayonnaise diet, where you're adding a very high fat mayonnaise like dressing to so many, um, so many of a child's of a child's meals or foods that you know, eventually the child or the adult would say, you know, the hell with that, it, you know, I just I'm tired of mayonnaise. So <laughs> it's it's important that when a ketogenic diet is recommended that the family or the patient be advised how to cook, how to make foods much more flavorful with healthy additions, herbs, spices, things like, again, coconut in a variety of different forms. Not coconut water, I should note, but coconut, um, whether it's sh shredded coconut, coconut oil, as well as things like grass-fed butter or heavy whipping cream. I mean, these high-fat dairy products can be a foundation for a ketogenic diet and it can also help immensely, not only with the palatability and the diversity, but can help immensely with the absorption of particular nutrients, which can offer further benefits to, uh, you know, the reason, the initial reason that the, that the ketogenic diet is, is being recommended therapeutically. So if I go back just a few slides here, I know we're, we're, we're running low on time. Um, we've talked a little bit about the research that supports a ketogenic diet. Again, it doesn't have to be uh, in any way unpalatable, it doesn't have to be um, overly restrictive. I, I, I think that most people have that idea that a ketogenic diet is too difficult for an individual to follow. But again, I, I think it's the way that a patient or population is educated that makes or breaks the effectiveness or the long-term compliance with a ketogenic diet. But protein really has to be closely monitored just as much as, as carbohydrates, to be honest. In, in fact, I, I would say that most people are overly carbohydrate restrictive and are not protein restrictive enough. And it keeps them out of that sweet spot with respect to ketosis, which is somewhere between, you know, 1.0 and 3.0 uh, millimoles. That's really, you'd want someone to use a ketone meter. I think that would be really important. Um, you know, they're widely available now from both a clinical as well as, you know, retail um, basis. But I, I would really want someone to use a ketone meter. And we're not talking about the type of ketosis here that is associated with starvation induced ketosis. I, it's really important I say that because there are, again, a lot of misconceived uh, or preconceived notions, I guess, around what ketogenic means or ketosis means. We're talking about having ketone levels in the 1.0 to 3.0 range as opposed to the 5.0 and higher range, which really only occurs with long term starvation. So, unfortunately, um, quite often, ketogenic is synonymous with healthcare, uh, you know, practitioners, providers with um, starvation-induced ketosis. These are these are not the same. We're talking about fat, healthy fat, being the staple of the diet.
And again, it, it's been shown that a ketogenic diet tends to spare muscle loss, also produces favorable changes in um, many of these blood lipids that we'd want to look more closely at, such as HDL and triglyceride levels. And for those individuals who have unique neurological patterns, whether that be some type of uh, brain cancer or, again, a seizure disorder, when you look at how a ketogenic diet influences things such as the mTOR pathway, um, you know, CERT1 generation, AMPK levels, it's really clear that the ketogenic diet has some some overlap with a calorie restrictive diet, but it doesn't have to be calorie restrictive and it can still provide an individual with the energy to maintain muscle mass because ketones also help with that, but that it's the protein restriction as well as keeping insulin levels low that produce these widespread benefits. Ayurveda, which again, as I mentioned, is um, a growing area of interest and recommendations being put forth by people who are in a variety of places uh, in medicine. And I, again, I've met so many people over the years who have used it as part of their practice, either on a personal level or in their own practice as a dietitian or as a, uh, as a physician, a clinical physician. And, you know, I, I think when you take a look at the research available to us um, in all the published peer-reviewed journals, you really unfortunately only have this one uh, peer-reviewed pilot study, which is a couple of years old, which looked at it as a potential um, intervention for weight loss. And it was combined with yoga. And again, I, I think the two are often uh, introduced to an individual or a group together because they tend to have their roots in the same place. And it's more a way of life. Ayurveda is much more a way of life, as is the, the paleo type intervention, than just a way that people are recommended to eat. Um, there are a long list of papers written by numerous researchers that are asking for more research in this area because they see the potential for Ayurveda to help individuals or populations. Because Ayurveda contains a variety of herbs and botanicals in it, um, it can contain very healthy fats, it can be focused around more fruits and vegetables, um, displacing grain-fed meats with healthier legumes. So, you know, there's there's really, I think, uh, growing interest in Ayurveda for so many reasons. Again, I, this is really the only clinical paper that I could share with you today. So in terms of the, that strength of research that so many of us are looking for, it's not there. It's not where we really maybe want it to be. But I'm hopeful that in the years to come that more and more organizations are going to consider funding research uh, around Ayurveda-based or Ayurvedic-based interventions because, again, in terms of what I've observed in India and what I've, you know, people shared with me here in North America, you know, a lot of people have found good results with Ayurveda. But in terms of uh, somehow measuring its efficacy with, with clinical papers, I, I'm sorry, I just don't have more um, at this date, at this date and time. Now, the last diet that I want to take a look at is the pH balance diet, which I remember clearly uh, 25 years ago. The first time I heard this, you know, it was, um, you know, it was really only being proposed as a possible intervention because of the work done by nephrologists in two different areas of the world. In San Francisco, the University of San Francisco, um, you know, Thomas Reamer, uh, and then it was also being looked at by a group of nephrologists over in Germany that were showing some very uh very interesting results with their attempts to manipulate the potential renal acid load of a diet and how that affected uh, not only the renal health, but er other areas of health in the populations they were looking at. Again, these were just small pilot studies. Now what we know is that there's a very significant body of evidence showing that the potential renal acid load of a population's diet, i.e. the metabolic acid load that's associated with the foods they eat day to day, um, can, really, can really predict a significant amount of risk or risk reduction, depending on whether that diet is acid loaded or more pH balanced. And again, you could be looking at trying to predict metabolic syndrome or looking at something like loss of muscle, mu muscle mass later in life, or looking at things like hypertension uh, or bone loss, which I know a lot of us have, have heard there's a relationship with over the past. In all of these different areas, there is considerable evidence now to make us ask the question, should we evaluate the potential renal acid load of our patients' diets with some type of dietary 
assessment tool. And there's an infinite number of possibilities with which how we could do that. The USDA, for instance, has the potential renal acid load value for most of the common foods in the U.S. food supply, not when they're combined with one another, but in their um, in their you know individual form. That would be very easy for that to be you know translated into a potential renal acid load uh, assessment tool, because really what we're talking about with the acid load is how does the protein contributed by a food, the phosphorus contributed by the food, and the sulfur that is contributed by any food, how does that challenge the body and the body's ability to buffer those acids out, predominantly through the, the use of the renal system and the microtubules and the hydroxylation reactions there, you know, because it's really, it, it's really imperative that we understand you will be able to maintain a blood pH of 7.39 um, even with a very high metabolic acid load at any given meal. But downstream from that, considerable efforts have to be made physiologically by the body to maintain that pH of 7.39. And when we eat more alkali-rich foods, i.e. foods that are high in magnesium, potassium most notably, and calcium, those alkali minerals tend to take some of the burden off of our renal system and off of our body's efforts to maintain that you know, very narrow parameter of blood pH. So again, the, the research around these pH-based diets and the potential risk reduction associated with them is fascinating. And I think that when we take a look at this, and again, there's a lot of misconceptions around it, like for instance, you know, acid loads, metabolic acid loads are not restricted to only meat and animal protein. In fact, some animal proteins such as whole milk and whole milk yogurts, I have to say whole because the more the fat you take out of some of these um, dairy products in particular, the more acidic they become. But whole milk and whole milk yogurts are pretty close to neutral, very, very weak acid loads, if any, uh, if at all. Grains are weak acids. They're not significant acid loads. They're only weak acid loads. Legumes are neutral to being weak acid loads. So these are, again, these aren't really significant variables in the equation. It is certainly meat, um, eggs, cheeses, even fish that tend to have the highest acid loads. But we have to consider the volume of any of these that someone is eating before we start to look at it too closely as being something that we want to eliminate from the diet in an effort to gain pH balance. All acid-forming foods do not have to be avoided to acquire pH balance. This is really important. Um, for instance, if someone wanted to eat fish or they wanted to eat some kind of legume or you know, they wanted to have eggs, for instance, it doesn't mean that they have to avoid those foods completely to maintain pH balance. Really, the take-home message from all of this research is that we have to have significant quantities of fruits and vegetables and potassium-rich foods in an effort to take some of that physiological burden off of the human body in an effort to buffer out those acid loaded foods. I hope that's really clear that this is not about avoiding any food with an acid load. This is about optimizing the balance by including dark green leafy vegetables, choosing the best sources of protein which have the lowest acid loads, i.e. whey protein is actually alkaline. There's a lot of misconceptions around whey protein. It's often talked about as a high acid load for the body when it's actually alkaline. It's a very weak alkaline, but it's not an acid load, whereas casein is the exact opposite. Casein is a very significant acid load. That's why cheese has such a high acid load. Um, you know, we've got a lot of different studies we could look at that would show or illustrate these relationships more clearly. Tufts University in the last several years have done some great, really has done some great work at the USDA uh, Center on Aging. They've shown that there are particular patterns such as high levels of grains associated with more bone loss in women. Um, so I really like the, you know, the work that's been done there. Um, by Bess Dawson Hughes. She's been one of the primary investigators there at the Tufts USDA Research Center on Aging, showing that you know these acid loads do in fact equate to higher levels of risk for particular things such as metabolic syndrome. Potassium is the greatest overall contributor to the alkali of any foods. We don't talk about the pH of a food when it's on the table or in your glass or in the refrigerator. It's really about how the food influences our blood chemistry after digestion and fat really is not a player in this. So fat is much, much more neutral. Um, pH balanced diets can be both vegetarian. They can be paleo. In fact, I, you know, when you take a look at plant-based diets, I think there's a lot of important questions we need to ask ourselves. You know, there's some great research to show that plant-based diets, 
um, with all of their phytonutrients and some of those benefits are, are, are very protective against inflammation. But you know, I, I, I often wonder, is it the fact that a plant-based diet with all the dark greens and root vegetables, such as sweet potatoes or yams and carrots, is it their high potassium content and their lower metabolic acid load that makes them more protective than let's say a standard American diet? And I, I want people in closing here to really appreciate the importance of specific types of carbohydrates in whatever plan it is they choose to embark upon or to investigate more closely. I think having microbially accessible carbohydrates or MACs and fermentable fiber is paramount. And I wouldn't want any population or any individual to embark on any of these dietary interventions that we've mentioned without having adequate amount of accessible, microbially accessible carbohydrates, which again, do not have to be sugars or simple, you know, or simple starches. These really have to be carbohydrates either in the form of fermentable fiber or resistant starch that microbes can work on and can live on. And this has been, again, demonstrated time and time again in terms of the importance of the microbiome, its health, keeping the uh, intestinal, the intestinal brush border and the level of integrity there where we want it. Um, and whether you're looking at the work of Justin Sonnenberg, uh, and Erica there at Stanford University, Erica Sonnenberg, uh, in terms of, you know, the direction that Western disease is going is quite often the loss of fermentable fiber in the diet. So with that being said, I really appreciate your interest in this topic and your participation in today's webinar. And with that, I want to thank you and I hope that you continue to look uh, at food and particularly real whole foods as part of the solution going forward. Thanks and have a wonderful day. Thank you guys. We did receive a number of questions. Um, in the interest of time, I know we are at that two o'clock mark. Um, we will be emailing you. If you had asked a question, we'll be emailing you the answer. We will also be sending an email through to you by the end of the day today with the certificate of completion so that you can claim your continuing education credits for this if you are a registered dietitian or a dietetic technician. Again, thank you so much for joining us on today's webinar. We hope we'll see you back here soon.